Kurz. Generic parallel programming. So last year, I gave a talk which was entitled Generic Programming for the Rest of Us. And so the natural extension I thought was um, yeah, to talk about parallel generic programming, how hard can it be? Um, so I will give a, a short recap on the general pro generic programming first. And I had in mind a couple of nice examples which I will show later on. So I thought, well, shouldn't be so difficult. But uh, then looking deeper into the problem and really uh, thinking about the uh, high aspirations of generic programming, I discovered quite a bit of um, difficulties here, and I will talk about that in the second half of the talk, or second section of the talk. But first, a uh, recap on generic programming. So, well, that's a quotation by Doug Gregor. Um, so, so the goal of general programming is to find one as a minimal requirement for an algorithm, or to put it the other way around, once we have found the minimal requirements, we have the most general version of the algorithm that could possibly be there. So this is a more or less a high aim of generic programming. So what we did, we started from a very simple C-like code, which sums up a vector of an array of doubles, and uh, removed um, dependency and assumption after assumption, and we ended up with a fairly generic uh, um, implementation, which is more or less um, the accumulate of the standard library. We have a general iteration uh, type. Um, we can have an arbitrary type for doing the computation, so it might differ from the value type of the iterator, perhaps a greater accuracy, and we have a quite general operator here. We can even deduce a neutral element if you want of the operation, which might come in handy in some situations. So, yeah, what are the minimal requirements now that we, that we have found? Well, the iterator could be the most general, simplest iterator type that is conceivable, just an input iterator, we just need a one pass through the whole thing, and we are done, and, and also the operator is fairly general. There are very, very little requirements on the operator. So first of all, it takes a second argument of type, uh, type V, which is just, um, well, just has to be convertible, or the value type of the iterator has to be convertible, and then it takes another argument of type U, which has nothing, nothing to do with the value type, actually, and um, can be completely different. And so this means we can, for instance, implement count if this our reduce easily. And further on, there are no other restrictions on the operator. It can be a really quite normal binary function. So we don't need associativity or commutativity in this case, which is for the this case, quite good, quite general. So now question is, is this the most possible, most generic version? Well, there are some things here which could be made better. So efficiency-wise, we could have different types of begin and end, which permit a slightly more efficient treatment of things like uh, C strings. You could have or could rep um, support in place uh, operators like plus equals. Well, there could be something done on the convenience of use or a range-based interface, would it make more easy or easier to use? You don't have to repeat your container or what is the source of the iterator twice. But there's a big, very big failure of the whole thing. And this is, what is it? Well, it's, it's sequential. And today this is certainly one of the greatest deficiencies of this algorithm, and I think it will e even increase in the future the, that, <coughs> let's say, uh, the perception that this is a rather um, big drawback of any implementation if it's just sequential. So the natural next step would be to go into parallel generic programming. So when I... Submitted the abstract, I thought, okay, well, how hard can it be? I have programmed in Perl for many years, so just uh, 
make a generic parallel algorithm, can't be so difficult, but if you look into the problem from different sides, you find uh, some problems and difficulties which are a bit unexpected or have you had not really considered so far, and some of them are quite particular to generic programming or at least come to the surface particular in that case. So I want to talk about these challenges now a bit. So in mind, it's always useful to have a, mind, a mental model in mind of what you want to program, what algorithms. Of course, there are many algorithms and all have their different uh, difficulties, but uh, I found it quite useful to have one concrete thing in mind. So it's, again, reduction. It's boring, I know. But um, if you uh, think about um, um, computing a product of K matrices with perhaps different dimensions, uh, you can play around with these um, parameters and uh, so can adapt uh, the problem to exhibit quite different characteristics in terms of performance. So this is quite useful mental model for me and perhaps also for you to, if one sees different options of parallelizing stuff um, to see how these would uh, fit with the various um, values of these parameters. Okay, so what were the challenges? Well, of course, we have for our old parameters on the reduce algorithm, for instance, we have new requirements. That's not very surprising, but um, okay, that's perhaps not a real challenge, but we can adapt to that. Then we have much more parameters which describe our solution. So computing a reduction operation in sequential is not really, um, they don't have so many options actually, but here we have a more, much more options on the solution side, how to do it actually. And there are quite uh, new difficulties which come up. So, well, first, uh, it's not so straightforward how to compose parallel components. So how do they nest? Can there be any problems? So we look, have a look into that. Um, then, of course, if you really want to go for the highest ambitions of uh, generic programming, you would abstract from everything there could be from Let's say you would like to abstract, if possible, from the hardware architecture, from hardware details. You would also like to abstract from parallel environments, whether you use OpenMP, um, C++, threads, P threads, whatever. So that would be the high goal, which is certainly a difficulty to achieve. And I just say you, I don't achieve it. But, Okay, let's start to look into um, these, these challenges. So in parallel, we have a totally new game. So the operator, which was very completely generic or general in, in the sequential case, it must at least be associative in the parallel case, otherwise we can't um, partition our work into groups and um, compute it group-wise and in, in small chunks. And it's even better if it's commutative because it permits more parallelism in the end, but it's not required. So you would already have two different solutions for associative and non-commutative operators and some for operators which are also commutative. Well, and then you need um, to do it efficiently. You need also an efficient way to split up your input sequence. So that means that normally input uh, forward iterators are not good enough because you have to go through the whole sequence once in a sequential way in order to partition it. That normally doesn't do it. Well, if you have enough work to do per operation, per operator application, it might be okay, but normally it's not good enough. And pure input iterators are and just don't cut it, so they are uns unsuitable. Okay, so if you have random access, obviously that's okay, it's easy, but it's not required. So you could have some tree-like structure as well where you can recursively uh, partition your work. So you would, of course, need some balancing here in your tree, otherwise you would end up with sequential execution. But um, basically you need something which is, um, like here, it's, it's a bit similar. Well, in, in threading building blocks, they have um, split, split constructor, which is more or less uh, something like recursive splitting here. And a very useful, but not required, is something if you can estimate the work you have per operation, so which can guide the division of the problem and the scheduling of the operators. Okay, these are the new requirements on your parameters. And then you have um, the design space of parallel components is 
normally much larger than the design space of the sequential ones. So we have, okay, you have problem parameters which describe your problem, which are more or less the same as before. We have value type, you have a type of sequence, uh, you have your operator, and then you have also your computational value type, which was the T, the init type, which you had seen before, which is also there in sequential, but they have much more parameters which describe your solution. So we can have different ways of um, splitting your sequence into subparts. There are lots of ways to do that. You have many ways to schedule the work you have there, to create it there, and uh, you have also options to put together the individual parts of your results. And uh, of course, you have a lot of context which you have to take into account in your algorithm. You, well, you can work on a shared machine, shared memory machine, you can work on a distributed memory machine, you can work on a machine with an accelerator where you have to offload your computation and so on. And, um, well, you have to take into account what is the machine parallelism available to me. So either static, the number of cores, or dynamic, how, because other parts of the program also use cores, or other programs use cores, you have to somehow get this information during runtime to make a good or uh, informed choice on your on your actions. Okay, look, let's look into detail into some of these aspects. So first we start here with uh, work partitioning. So you have several options. So the maximal split partitioning splitting would be just make very uh, tiny chunks of two elements and have n half of them for the whole sequence. And the minimal thing would be just split in two and then perhaps repeat until you have reached a sufficient level of parallelism, or it doesn't pay off anymore. So this is the modest approach that threading building blocks uh, chooses. This could make sense for if you have really large operations, like big matrices, so you would likely split up in very small parts. And the easiest one, so if you use OpenMP and doesn't, don't say anything, it will just be split up in P parts if you have P processors statically available, which might not always the best if you have more work to do than just your a single sequence. So the best option really uh, depends on the work which is required for each operation. If you have little work to do, you would not uh, do such a fine grain spelling. If you have lots of work to do per operation, you would perhaps prefer that. You have to take into account how much parallelism is there. So if you, I don't, if you don't have, uh, can use, can't use all your cores actually, you would likely split it into less than if you have uh, 100 cores at your disposal. And of course, on the total work to be done, it's also, if you have very little work to do, then perhaps you don't do any splitting because it's just overhead. Yeah. So this is one parameter, which is extra to the sequential case. Then you have um, to consider how to map your work to actual um, power execution units or threads or whatever there is, or processes. Um, so simplistic, um, approaches, like if you just do it in OpenMP, which do, do it directly, more or less, um, one chunk, one thread. So if you don't specify any um, scheduling clauses, but you, if you have more tasks or more work items created, then you have hardware parallelism, you have to think about which thread gets which part, when, in which order. And also you have normally to handle the dependencies of tasks, so if you have Computer two adjacent parts of the um, um, reduction, you can combine the results into a, the result of the larger chart, um, the larger chunk, but you have to wait, of course, until both are ready. So you have to organize that. So this is uh, already here. Um, yeah, when you have uh, computer partial solutions, you have to combine them in a way to co produce a global solution. And um, yeah. So there would be, again, two extreme cases. The least parallel just have a master who does it and he gets all partial results and just, then just does a sequential reduction, might be efficient in some cases. And the most parallel thing is if you have a tree-wise reduction of pairs of, of results. So, <clears throat> and here you would have much more freedom if uh, the operation is commutative because you can freely order the parts. Otherwise, you will have to stick to the order.
And if this is not enough, there are more options you could think about it. I won't go into detail here. Perhaps leave it as food for thinking for you. So you could think about, well, for instance, it doesn't make, can make a difference in which order you uh, group the operations. If you have matrices with varying dimensions, the number of computations depends on the parentheses you put around them. So, yeah, you could perhaps do it in the pre-processing step, and then the result of the input to the generic algorithm would be rather a tree of multiplications instead of just an ordinary sequence. And, well, if you don't have enough parallelism in neither in the reduction alone and the multiplication alone, you could think about partially um, computing the, or feed partial results into the next product. So if you have computed A, we're going to compute A times B times C, all matrices, and you have computed the first part of A times B, you could feed that in theory into the next one, but I think that's taking us too far. I'll leave it to you to think about that, if it makes sense or not. Um, but there are really millions of options if you look, look into the details. Okay, so these are the parameters we can play around with and sometimes have to play around with when creating parallel components. The next thing is um, how can we compose parallel components? Or can we always compose them easily? Well, Actually, in sequential case, we don't really think about whether we can or cannot. We just take it for granted, essentially. We just combine as, as we like or as we wish. So uh, the requirements are fairly minimal. Of course, things have to be copyable normally, so in this case here. But otherwise, which is met by more or less most types. But uh, we don't need, really need to think about whether we can or we cannot. It's quite a different story in parallel. So one thing is, um, so generic components are made for accepting more or less every conceivable type which meets the minimum requirements. In a recent paper by Gottschalk and Böhm, they pointed out an example where this can lead to a deadlock if the thing you nest or put in takes a log. For instance, I think their example was a log on a logging file. Don't have the example here, but so things like that can happen can't exclude them, and perhaps a bit more realistic or more common. So let's say we have implemented our reduce with OpenMP, and we call it with a matrix type, which someone else has, that is also parallelized, the multiplication is parallelized using C++ threads. So will that work? What do you think? No, I mean, strictly, I'm, on Intel platforms, I think it's, it's normally going to work. Um, in general, it's undefined behavior because, well, there's no guarantee from OpenAP that it will work with other threading models. So it's undefined behavior. Okay, so let's say we were conservative and stick to OpenAP for both. Yeah, and we have um, now our parallel reduction with OpenAP and also matrix multiplication parallelized with OpenAP. What will happen if we nest these in a generic parallel reduce operation? So there basically are two, two options. Either we have no parallelism in the left for the matrix, matrix multiplication, so it's completely sequential, or we again create for each part of the um, partition of the reduction, again, the full number of threads, which leads to massive oversubscription. So if we have 12 cores, um, OpenMP will normally create then 12 threads working on the reduction, <coughs> and then depending on some par um, configuration parameters of OpenMP, we will end up with, again, 12 threads for each matrix, matrix multiplication, <coughs> which leads us to 144 threads, which is much too much, if you only have 12 cores. <coughs> so, of course, it would be, in theory, possible to take this into account, and some do some internal balancing of the number of threads, but it would really complicate the parallel code because we would have to check which, how many cores are there and somehow estimate the work and evenly divide the cores among the various tasks here. <coughs> so, well, 
there are some constraints on the composability of the components. So this is a very weak attempt to phrase it. So if you want to re have components which can be reused as parameters in uh, parallel components, um, other parallel components, they should not or must not specify any explicit synchronization, explicit um, parallel execution, more like the number of threads that will be used. So otherwise, they don't really can't <coughs> nest it or compose very well, or even led to incorrect pro behavior. So it's still some, I feel it's a field which is very much open, so I need much more thinking about. So, <coughs> so at least I feel I did not think much or enough about that one here to make any conclusive statement here. But it's certainly a field needing exploration. <coughs> okay, the next one. Well, if we, it's normally a fundamental difference whether we are on a shared memory architecture or distributed memory architecture, because in the one hand, in this distributed case, or in the shared case, we have the whole thing in our hands, but in the distributed case, we only have a part of the whole thing in our hands at any local process, and we must know that in our overall component. So <clears throat> we would need to do something extra in the distributed case to combine the partial results. <coughs> Sorry, I have to drink a bit because otherwise I need a coughing break. So it's difficult to come up with a fully generic solution which covers all possible hardware architectures. But in general, <clears throat> one can come up with solutions which cover large parts of the total solution in, in, a, <coughs> in a generic way. And I will have examples for that later on. So we can try to squeeze uh, differences into some, okay, encapsulate in some specific smaller components. Okay, um, the other question is, can we simply abstract from, let's say we are on a shared memory machine anyway, and um, can we have just another parameter which tells us we are using OpenMP, uh, C++ threads, P threads, or whatever? Well, it's, I will also show examples <coughs> why this is not so <coughs> easy. Just as a hint now, OpenMP pragmas uh, are sort of mechanism outside of the language it doesn't really mesh well with, with generic programming. So for instance, in earlier versions of OpenMP, you could not use, uh, <coughs> you could not parallelize an iterator-based loops. Now it works, but it had to be added explicitly to the OpenMP specification that you can do that. So there are some problems to mix it freely with, um, with, with generic programming and C++. The other question is, um, we have seen that we normally need some information on the, from the runtime system on the context. So how many threads can we create? Are there, how many cores do we have? How, many, much, what, how much parallelism do we have? Um, <coughs> and this is also something that is not good nor standard interface for at the moment. So, um, and it will certainly complicate generic components if we do so. And I hinted at if we really specify directly in the component, it will severely impact the generosity and the composability of our components. So, well, what are the perspectives? So if we really aim for 100% generic components, which are really generic across the hardware architecture, across the parallel environments, frameworks we are used, I would say at the moment it's perhaps hard to reach because of there's so much context dependency in that that um, I would say uh, it's it's hard to achieve. Maybe in a future time we even have more standard interfaces to some of the information we need. Well, the alternative would be somehow to turn the interface inside out in a way to create 
abstractions which are perhaps domain specific, like for imaging, mesh generation, and so on, or meshing. I will show some examples later on, and uh, which take over the data partitioning, the task creation, which should not be too explicit here on the details of the implementation on the threading model and so on. And then we would uh, go on and create parallel implementations which are not so generic but specific to contexts like OpenMP or a distributed way and so on and that isolate, isolate this specific code in a way. So in this uh, respect, I think the model of threading building blocks is quite good because it's mostly focusing on creating tasks and has a central central entity for dealing with the task then, which is independent of the algorithm. Okay, so um, that was enough rather abstract talk. I will now go slightly more concrete in dealing with more concrete examples, how you could use generic programming for concrete programs, uh, program problems. So, um, so first start with image processing. They only lose a couple of words. I will stay quite high level here. Then I go a bit, go to mesh processing. They get a bit more concrete. And in the end, I have an application based on particle uh, interactions where I will show a concrete example in OpenMP. They can have at least some generic generosity. And let's start with image processing. So what I will look only at parts of image processing, namely algorithms which are local in a sense that you have either point-wise operations just computing the output pixel but just by looking at the input pixel and more generally you have a neighborhood a fixed neighborhood of neighbor pixels which you use to compute your output pixel and this we call also the window of the algorithm or the stencil of the algorithm here and uh, the actual computation here this f um, is then captured in a local compute kernel and with, with these kernels, you can then express uh, the computation quite easily or generically. In a sequential case, you have this local operation, local kernel, which will just be applied to all image pixels. Um, and these kernels may carry state from the next pixel, from one pixel to the next pixel, like in median computation, it's usually done. Um, and an important property of this um, local kernel is the stencil because it allows us to um, also in parallel to schedule the algorithm appropriately and to partition the work appropriately. So in parallel, it was it's more or less the same, but the only difference that we only apply the local operation to sub-images instead of the images. So we can have quite generic components for partitioning the work and for parallel execution, so, um, which can work for any type of images and also work for any type of these this particular class of algorithms, the kernel-based algorithms, and we can have components which are special, specialized to the relevant architecture types, like distributed or shared memory, which will drive the algorithm. So I talked about the work partitioning, and it could look like that here. So in a shared memory case, it would just have a well, straightforward partition into uh, rather equal size tiles, and in the distributed case, which is slightly more interesting, you would need to have, depending on your stencil, some overlapping regions, because this is distributed on each on four processors in this case, and you would need to copy data from the neighbor partitions in your thing. And the good thing is uh, you can do this completely automatically without reference to the concrete algorithm. The only thing you need to know is um, the stencil of your kernel. That guides you um, the, how to create the overlap. So, um, and you could use a, just such a component um, with overlapping images also for, let's say, shared memory machines. If they are non-uniform access memory, you would like to schedule the threads according to the locality of the data. So, um, it's a bit more general than just um, for distributed images. Okay, so this was fairly high level. We get a bit more concrete now when talking about meshes. So what is a mesh? Who knows what a mesh is? Okay, for the others have some images. So for instance, here is the outer uh, the <coughs> region around the airplane wing cross section, which is so used for CFD calculations. Um, 
I have here um, a biomechanical application. Geographic information systems also use type of meshes, mathematics or chemical, 3D chemical formulas also can use things like that or find element, computer aided engineering all use meshes. So the idea of uh, parallel mesh processing is in a sense similar to the image processing in a sense that I regard the image processing I presented uh, to be just a special case of mesh processing. But there are some difficulties compared to images because there is no straightforward um, way to index neighbors, for instance. So in um, mesh process, or image processing, you can just say go, go left, go up, go wrong, go right. But here is no right, no left, no up. Um, you have to come up with the other way. You must, even if you want to partition your mesh, you have to compute that. It's not a trivial task to do it if you want to have a good partitioning. And also there is no straightforward way to compute the overlaps in the case of a distributed mesh. And of all, the question is uh, how can one handle meshes in a generic way at all? So like sequences, for instance. And the good news is you can more or less generalize the approach for sequences also to meshes. So we have two basic types of iterators here. One are sequence iterators, which are more or less correspond to the well-known iterators from the SDL. Just move through the cells like here or 2D cells of a mesh. <coughs> and then you have incidence iterators, which gives you access to all um, cells incident or directly sitting on a given cell. So if you look at that triangle, we get these three vertices with incidence iterator, for instance. Or you could also access the neighbor cells here. This is similar iterator. So <clears throat> only very high level overview here. Don't go into the details. But if you look at an example, a very simple algorithm which averages the, neighbor, the values of the neighbor cells. So this is a pseudocode of the algorithm. We go over all cells in a grid with a sequence iterator. We initialize our average here. We go over all neighbor cells here. These are these three neighbor cells and add to the average and then compute divide by the number of items. Okay, and this uh, is a generic version of that. So first we create a mapping from cells to doubles, which is our average here. <coughs> then we go over all cells of our mesh, initialize, go over all neighbors here and add to our average and then compute the uh, divide by the number of items here. So and the important thing is here that we only need in the SQL only need the structural properties of this algorithm, which is the stencil of the algorithm, which is just going from cells to neighbor cells. Here, we can just have a very brief representation as CC for that if you want. But this is a thing we need then if you want to create a distributed mesh. <coughs> so, first step, if you want to partition our work is to compute such a partitioning. We can use a mesh partition, graph partitioning algorithm for that. And then using our stencil of the algorithm, we can compute uh, some, um, let's say, halo range around it. So we need, here's the dark cells we need from the other partitions and we have some, what you can't probably see here, also some inner ranges which describe the cells that other parts need from us if we are in a distributed way. <coughs> and these things will then be um, important if we update other parts. And as I said, this is completely generic. The generic on the mesh type, the generic on the algorithm type. So the parallel algorithm looks now very similar. So instead of a normal grid, we have a distributed grid which just creates all these overlapping structures under the, under the hood. And um, so there's a difference. We um, just go not over the whole local mesh, but only on the local range, which is if you something which is excludes the black or the dark cells here because we don't want to compute on them. There's other parts which we will compute on those cells here. <coughs> so and then 
Here we have ended our local computation, and then the only step which remains is to communicate our results to our neighbors and receive the results of our neighbors to our local uh, representation. So now we have a, this um, function here, average function will be consistent across the whole distributed mesh. And it's all hidden here in this update function and the data structures which are created here. So this is a very generic way of handling um, distributed mesh algorithms. So uh, the code actually looks quite similar if for distributed and shared memory. <coughs> so this was a distributed memory case, essentially. For shared memory, you would net add an additional loop over the different parts of the mesh, which is now handled implicitly in a distributed case. <coughs> Yeah, we could um, extend our distributed grid to accept a policy, so which would drive the creation of these intermediate ranges or the, the partitioning policy. So we could create a distributed variant or shared memory variant where we would perhaps have all in one or perhaps also distributed if you have on a non-uniform access machine. And uh, the loop body, which we have now explicitly stated here, we could capture this also in a corner like object and uh, we could use lambdas to um, help here but we only lambdas will in this case not be sufficient because we have here must know which of our um, let's say um, data structures we have to update after the loop and the um, optimization of that would be um, of that code would be to overlap communication and computation, which is very important in the distributed case because you can then try to hide the latency of the communication. Because so here, in this step, we have of course to wait until all is all has finished, all communication has finished. What we can do is to instead of on the local range, we can perhaps um, only loop over the boundary, which is contains the data which is interesting for our neighbors and starts the communication once we have finished that and then continue in the inner range which will make, make it likely a bit, um, a bit more complicated and then it will be very useful if we have captured that in a tool kernel so we don't have to spell it out twice. <coughs> yeah, and um, all this is a quite generic solution to um, a parallel mesh generation, a mesh handling or mesh processing algorithm. So this logic you have to spell out only once for all types of this class of algorithms. Okay, so I go to the next, next example, which is um, the particle method, which actually comes from astrophysics. So I have a lot of particles interacting, and uh, by the, the interaction you can simulate um, a flow, for instance, so I have a Example here, and this algorithm can deal with complex geometries easily. So this is called lock release benchmark. I choose the title on purpose. Uh, it fits well with the parallel uh, approach. And the idea is you have here uh, rather this uh, a denser medium, and uh, here's a lighter medium, and you have a wall in between, and you release the wall or the lock, and then it starts to flow. Would look like that, and this would be quite difficult to do with a mesh-based approach because the mesh would change every second or in each time step. So it's a very, um, very um, versatile tool to compute um, uh, a fluid flow. And the basic algorithm is, is here. You have a, a long list of time steps. And in each time step, you would uh, a new compute the neighbors for each particle because they, at first they change a lot, the neighborhood change a lot, it's very dynamic, if you, as you have seen, and you loop over all particles, and you loop over all neighbors of the particles and compute interactions between the particles and update the interactions of both particles, and then you, based on the interactions you have computed, you update the particle positions, and the next time step can go on. Now let's look a bit uh, into the details of the neighbor computation. So you start with a um, particle i, you have a radius i for this particle, and you, all, 
in this, uh, in this circle are neighbors of that particle, and you have the next uh, particle, also have neighbors, and so on. And now you leave out half of the neighbors, which results in a sort of unilateral neighborhood graph. And the reason for that is twofold. First, it's efficiency. Because the interactions are symmetric, you need to compute it only once. So at most, the sign is reversed. So you can, let's say, save half of the computations if you do it like that. And there's also an algorithmic reasons. If you're already very locally, it might be that you see one neighbor, sorry, one neighbor only from one side anyway. So you have no easy way to have a symmetric graph in that case. So the bottom line is you have a unilateral graph and you have to update the interactions from one particle perhaps from the other particle. And this leads to interesting, let's say, dependencies. If you look at that algorithm here, so we see here, you update the interactions of I, but also the interactions of some other particle at the same, in the same step. And this means here you have possibly a conflict because this other particle here can also be updated from other, other particles or from it itself, for instance. So we have a sort of a data race if we have, let's say, three threads working on, so here threads working on these particles and update the particle i, or at the same time, you will also write at the same time into the same memory location, you have a data race. Who knows what a data race is? Everybody, so I don't have to explain it. So we, it's clear we have to avoid that. That's bad. We must eliminate that. So I can uh, skip over here. So we have um, interesting dependence um, due to this asymmetric storage. And there are different options to deal with that. I will present one in detail, which is not the best one, but it's the only one I can fit on the slide. Um, I will discuss that in a bit detail. But it's, from the outside, not clear what is the best strategy to do. So we need several, to implement several of them and compare them, benchmark them. And um, on the other hand, we have this pattern, this uh, loop, what I showed you, have that loop as it on the, over the particles in several places in the code because they compute different types of interactions. And we would um, then need to have a parallel implementation for each of these loops. And we try to reuse our parallelization for different loops. So this is where generic programming comes into play. I will show an example later for that. But first, I will um, show how we try to, um, uh, what different options we have investigated for parallelization. So the obvious thing is um, if we have updates on the same particle at the same time, we must somehow guard these writes to that same memory location. There are different options. Um, I could use logs, which is quite expensive because we have, can have millions of particles, and so we would need millions of logs, which is not an attractive perspective. So we try to use atomic operations for that, which are normally cheaper for this um, for these operations because they normally have hardware support. Uh, the other way would um, to avoid the conflicts by introducing copies of the, of the array um, in a thread local way and combine them later in a more coordinated way, but this is, turns out to be quite expensive. <clears throat> then better options are look at more into the structure of the problem. We could group particles into blocks which are separate by phases, so avoid all conflicts, and also use a type, several types of domain decomposition, very similar to what, in idea, what I showed before on the imaging and the meshes. So I won't go into detail of these um, options, only look here a bit more in the first one, which I said is not the best one, but the easiest one to understand. So um, one way to remove this data races is to use atomic updates. So in OpenMP, you just use this pragma OMP atomic. And then we can um, avoid or make um, the load and stores indivisible of each operation. And this guarantees, in our case, that <coughs> we have the expected outcome here. So this means in, and in well, we can also do it, would we'll be able to do it in C++, but it would be look a bit more complex because that's only the basic template here, atomic double which uh, doesn't have this um, update operation. So we must implement it our own. I don't go into detail where it looks a bit, um, we have to code something, but it works. 
Well, and the big, but the big, big drawback is that all memory locations you want to update atomically, like that one here, have to be declared before a standard atomic double. So all our particle interactions would have to be of that type, and which is also not very attractive from my perspective. Okay, so let's see. Here's the sequential algorithm. And so well, we write an OMP parallel 4, which makes it parallel. The global loop is parallelized. But then we have the conflicts here. And we must protect both with atomic. And yeah, then it works, but we do a bit too much here. Because this one here, we update in the inner loop re uh, repeatedly. So it's always, it's, um, we replace it with a local variable, which is always a good idea to do, or the first thing to look if you have these uh, conflicts, if you can replace such a global shared location with a local one. So we introduce a new one here, which we can add freely to, which is local to the thread. And we only use the atomic then outside the inner loop. So we have more or less saved half of the atomics. Okay, we still have a lot, of course. So, okay, now, as I said, we have several of these loops, and you want to use this approach here, which is now specific. Um, well, we have different implementations. Well, this is, of course, not a one-liner normally. It's just a block of uh, placeholder for a block of complex code, which computes some interaction here, and we have different of these compute interaction type of functions. So the idea is more or less similar to what we did before to transform these loop bodies into kernels, compute kernels. And then we have such a strategy like we saw before with the atomic updates. We implement that generically with regard to the kernel, but it will be specialized to a specific parallel environment. I will have a brief look later on into what has to be done if you want to um, also try to general, make it generic on the parallel environment, which is not so straightforward. <coughs> okay, and we have some other strategies like the blocking approach, which needs some pre-processing. It's not covered here, but we would need a way to cover that in the strategy selection object. I won't talk about that here. It's another talk. Okay, these kernels will compute two results, one per pair, so ij pair. And um, so it's this is one here. And we can get uh, this computation. is computation in the inner loop. We can optionally have also computation in the outer loop. If there is some, some pre-processing to be done per particle, we visit. Might be that we have some initialization here. And we will have these two results, which can be then retrieved by the, the generic algorithm and to put into the various locations where it fits. So here's the generic approach. Um, now we have a template on the kernel and also input output types, of course. Um, we initialize the kernel with the input types, so all the data we need to compute the results of the kernel. Again, we have the parallel four. So we compute potentially any pre-processing step here. And here's more or less the main step, which then is delegated to the kernel. And we have now our two output locations, out i, which is again a local variable, and the out j, which is a <coughs> shared variable. And this now works for all types of computations in the kernel. So we can reuse this across all our, we had five different locations where we use that. And this we also did for different strategies. So we could had, let's say, set of parallel strategies at our disposal, and we had a logic to select them at runtime, which uh, strategy would be used for computation of the kernel of the, of the parallel um, interactions, and we could then switch between them and benchmark that and select the best one for the concrete data um, we had. Okay, so the question now I raised, or I touched upon, can it be, be even more generic? So. As I said, the code is specialized to the parallel framework, OpenMP in this case we use. We could, of course, create versions for 
um, a CD thread. Um, yeah, and if you look at uh, what we need, go back here, what we need uh, is essentially we need a parallel four and we need some atomic update operation for this particular algorithm. So it's not that much, essentially. So if you want to abstract from the threading framework, we must somehow parameterize the parallel loop and the atomic updates. Okay, the parallel loop, well, is essentially a part for each, which does not seem to be so difficult, so we could likely do that easily. Um, so, of course, this for each assumes independent iterations, which we don't have, but we deal with that elsewhere. So we can say it's now independent in the context of for each, so that would work. And um, of course, if we do it with standard thread, we don't have the scheduling options in Open, which are available in OpenP. If we want to benefit from that, we would have to implement that also. But anyway, it's doable, in, certainly doable in you also using standard STD thread, and we could likely have a then branch to a generic for each or to a for each, which is specialized by replacing the OMP parallel for with a for each, a parallel for each, which is then specialized to use either OMP or steady thread. So this is workable. So didn't do it, but it seems to be easy. It's uh, the atomic updates. Well, that's not so easy because there's a fundamental difference. I already mentioned it before. The, if you have the OpenAP atomics, we can just use a built-in type. The data of built-in type, we had just doubles in this case, and more or less just write this directive before, more or less we can wrap uh, this atomic update around existing types. It's not possible in the C++11 atomics, because uh, if you want to do that, we must declare them already as STD atomics. So all of our million of uh, thread interactions would need to be declared as the atomic, which might have, I didn't try it out, it's, for me it's not attractive that I have to wrap my fundamental data types into such a thing which I don't know exactly what it does. Likely it's just binary also a uh, double in this case, but still uh, we would need to, it would need have parameterized all our global data structure with this, this, this CD atomic, which, um, means we can't encapsulate our parallel solution in a, just in a generic routine, we must change our data structure before. So, um, yeah, and likely we also would need to wrap, again, this STD double because it doesn't support all, uh, it doesn't support any arithmetic operations, so we likely would need to further wrap that into another type, and um, we have a Uh, atomics do it, uh, support um, update uh, compound assignment. No, yes. only, only only integer. Yeah. Only integer. No, no floating point. Okay. I looked it up. <laughs> that it's it's uh, we have well, it's just generic. Well, this is um, just supports the generic. Uh, it's a very small set of operations: load, store, um, compile, change, strong, strong and weak. So it's only four operations, I think and you have to do the rest yourself. Anyway, that's not a big problem. The big problem is this one here, that you have all your data must be SAD atomic. So it, well, you can't really localize then your, um, the difference into this, the generic root, routines. It's not possible. But of course, also the OpenMP approach is not impeccable, so it only for, um, doesn't, there is no support for user-defined types, so at one of the loops they had, small 3D vectors, which is are not supported by OMP Atomic, so we have a partial solution of that with a uh, templated wrapper, so um, if T is um, a base built-in type, we just use a normal at OMP Atomic, and for other T, we use it component-wise, which works for the addition, but it won't work if in more complex cases, um, so because we can't maintain any invariant of the whole object, um, atomically. So let's say if we have um, complex representatives in polar coordinates, if we want to add some other, um, well, some data, some other complex number to it, so we have to load it, both components, convert it, add, and um, store back. But uh, not, not, um, it could be that another thread will load um, 
the components, but we'll get one component before and one after our update. So it's inconsistent state, and so it's not a complete solution. It works only for the case of simple addition, component-wise addition. So otherwise, you would need to lock. So if you have more complex objects anyway, you would need to lock at some point, which also makes the whole solution very unattractive in this case. So there would be better algorithms, which I only have very limited time to explain. So one was, would be a blocking approach. It would group particles, which are then handled by a single thread, like here, the, or in, in this one box would be handled by one thread, or this would be handled by one thread and this. And we can execute in parallel also um, all these boxes um, um, tagged with one because they are far enough away, so there can't be a conflict if we one thread makes this one and one thread makes that one. This is the first phase, and we have a second phase, which is um, when we act on the number two ones. Again, no conflict if we do that in parallel and so on. We have in total four phases here. We can improve that a bit that we only use three phases in 2D, and in, in 3D would have gone, we have to have more phases, so six at least. To do that. So it's a bit of sequentialization, but if you have a good load balance in each phase, it's still okay. I think this was a quite successful algorithm, and you could also have something um, with domains. I won't explain further here. The interesting bit is in this blocking approach here, the actual parallel algorithm would be trivial. You would have no atomics, only one parallel loop. That's all. So this would be easily to do in a very generic way, actually. And it's also better than the uh, atomic variants. Yeah, so I said that. Um, we have these, these things are completely free of conflicts. These are better, but need some more thinking, one more diving into the specifics of our problem, but it's rewarding. So what was the benefit of using generic approach here in this particular example? Yeah, first it was a reduced programming effort because we don't didn't have to repeat our loops, or parallel loops, uh, five or six times. We could uh, also easily switch between the different variants by having a central logic for switching between algorithmic variants. And we could um, test it better, because if you have floating point interactions, you will have difference in your outcome. It's difficult to tell if it's because you have a wrong algorithm or if just because you changed um, the sequence of, oper of operations. So it's a sort of fuzziness, and we can remove it by using integers. So, of course, you can't use integers for the real algorithm, but you can use it for testing. If you have your generic components, you can having, have kernels with integers, and you can then easily spot any, uh, any errors here. And you can also use a constructed artificial test harness, which somehow pro provokes conflicts, so have, has many conflicts and to provoke any potential race condition or unearth that. Okay, so yeah, I come to the conclusions. I feel there are some obstacles, some substantial obstacles for completely generic components. So the composability and nestability of components is unclear. So what is the best way to design components that they can be nested? So one way could be the thread building blocks way of creating tasks, for instance, only. Um, of course, we have fundamental dependence on hardware architectures which cannot easily be removed. Um, the pair of frameworks are quite heterogeneous. Um, sometimes it's limited. The interoperability with the core language is limited in the case of OpenMP. In the case of uh, C++, C++, C++ Atomics, you had this global dependency or global requirement to have all your types declared, uh, atomic, and so on. So let's say to achieve fully 100% generic parallel components in the, let's say in the highest uh, aspiration of, of generic programming, it seems at least difficult to say it weakly. But I mean, the good news is one can do a lot. I think I showed a lot of examples where you can really, really factor out the difficult stuff into generic components and leave only a thin layer of specific code. You can encapsulate the lower level code. Often you can encapsulate in a small component and have the rest in a very generic way. Let's say by making your interface or the parallel components rather agnostic 
as, possible, as agnostic as possible on the concrete details by generating tasks rather than starting threads, for instance. So I think there is, um, not all hope is gone, but there are some deep borders which still need to be explored. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Uh, do you have any data, data on scalability of the atomic approach? Um, the scalability of the, the particle approaches? Of, of, uh, of use of atomics, either with open... I have, or... um, I have scalability data. I can show, I have another presentation. I can Does show it scale you well? It scales surprisingly well. So it was, I was surprised, well, it's not so as good as the other approaches, but I mean, the other approaches lead a lot, lot more coding upfront for the pre-processing, and uh, the, the, the atomics approach is fairly trivial to implement. So it's only three lines, or you have to, it's really, the payoff in terms of scalability is quite good, I think. And also how, uh, how difficult or easy it is to use blocking approach with uh, irregular grids? Regular meshes. Well, it's uh, the blocking approach is only for for these particles. Yeah, it's um, well, it's it works quite well for for area regular things. So, um, it the big question in this approach is um, how long can you use the blocks how, uh, across how many time steps? If um, the particles move too too fast, you can't use the blocks very long, and then you have to recompute that, and this will reduce the scalability. So it's more a question on the dynamics of your particles instead of the irregularity or not of your initial configuration. Um, for the algorithms which require pre-processing, uh, for example, partitioning, do you also parallelize the pre-processing? <laughs> Um, no, in these examples, I relied on third-party tools. I mean, there are parallel tools for to do that in a distributed way. I'm not sure if likely there are also things that do the partitioning in a shared memory way, but I'm not aware of that. I didn't use that. I, this one I use for um, mostly for distributed memory. It's also some time ago I did, did that. But sure, for a fully scalable approach, you would need to have that also. Depends, of course, again, on how often you have to change it. In a static way, you, setting you don't need to change it for the whole time. If you have mesh adaptation, of course, you need to have some incremental approach on updating your partitionings, which also should scale. Yeah. Hi, um, I have a physical question. Yes. You showed this interaction in the SPH simulation. Yes. Shouldn't there be one negative in sign? Likely. Yeah, I think okay. normally it's, I think we had, um, I was a bit confused. Um, I think we had different uh, um, loops, and some were um, negative, some not. Okay. So um, because it splits the whole computation. But you are right. In the basic case, it's it's negative. But still, you need only one computation for that. No, I mean one is positive, the other one is negative. Yeah. Because you, one you is should have I go the other one is say, just the other direction. Yeah, yeah. Yes. To make it more general, I would need. Let's say where is it? Yeah, 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 would minus plus, minus. Here it would have a minus. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And That's another it. one, um, this SPH, can this be used for granular systems? Like granular meta simulations? I don't know. Yes, it's quite versatile. It's used for quite a number of stuff, but I'm not really into the details of the application of that program. Uh, hello. Uh, all the stuff like OMP and standard thread is for parallelizing um, simulations on one machine. Do you also have some uh, things to parallelize over like distributed machines or you don't do these things? Um, there was, uh, for this application, or uh, only the measures for instance, this was mostly distributed. Like, do you use MPI or do you also I, have... For, for distributed I use MPI, yes, uh. because I think there is nothing but else actually for distributed machines. Uh, just a quick question about generic programming. Where's the end? I mean, 
I don't your, know. Uh, your ansatz is basically to make everything generic in your algorithm. But why don't you just, because especially in parallelism, uh, it goes very near to the hardware. Uh, we have OpenMP, we have C++ threads, we have thread in building blocks, we have, you name it, you know? Why not just, okay, pick three of the frameworks, implement them, and then use tech dispatching to actually do the implementation? Because I understood your talk, okay, let's try to make everything generic. Why, do I, why don't you just be pragmatic and say, okay, I know my abstractions, I know my computations, and I'll just implement them in the best two frameworks, I don't know. Well, I was pragmatic in my examples <laughs> because of practical reasons, but the question is more, um, well, if you can do something more general, you could potentially save a lot of effort in the long run. So um, it's not, I think, also thread building blocks, OpenMP, I don't think it's the last word. So my, out of curiosity, I want, wanted to know how far one could go. Of course, there are some obstacles, but um, if you can, can do something more, more general, let's, let's say, let's um, look at the combination of partial results or the splitting of, of, of a sequence. So um, we say if you use threading building blocks, it's you are fixed to a single strategy like uh, recursive partitioning or recursive halving. So if you want other have other strategies, uh, you would like them, of course, ideally available for all your implementations at once. So this would be a, I think a legitimate reason, a legitimate reason to look into a generic implementation of that. And the question is, how can I do it, or what other problems there? Still, of course, yeah, in practice, if one has to deliver something, one will more or less make uh, compromises, as I did in my examples. But uh, still, I think it's a valid question to think about or ask oneself how far can we go, possibly, or what are there any fundamental reasons not to go farther? <laughs>